All right. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for joining me today. Um, so for uh, getting started, if this will advance. Okay. There you go. Oh, there you go. Um, so just an overview of how this lecture is going to go. We're just going to first talk about definitions and clarifications about kind of what is palliative care. And then we'll talk most specifically about management of some common cancer associated symptoms. Um, I do want to highlight cancer pain, especially since that's something that I feel is very important to manage even above all other symptoms. And then talk a little bit about um, death and euthanasia, which is often the sequela to kind of the, the palliative and hospice care decision. And then we'll follow with just some case examples of some palliative care cases that I've managed in, uh, in my career. So what is palliative care? Um, one of the most common misconceptions, I think, is that palliative care is automatically synonymous with hospice care. And that's not actually true. Um, they often go hand in hand, but they are not one and the same. So palliative care um, just means relieving the symptoms of a disease or disorder at any stage of the illness. And I would also argue it involves involving the symptoms of any kind of treatment that you're doing as well. Hospice care specifically refers to palliative care in patients nearing the end of their life. So in general, for the purposes of this talk, we are going to talk about um, palliative care for cancer patients, which is often given in the hospice care setting. Um, so in this talk, they are, it is generally going to refer to kind of the, the palliative care alone for pet owners who are not electing to move forward with, um, with any kind of cancer specific treatment. So when we think about palliative care for cancer patients, when owners are trying to decide on if that's the best choice for them, no other disease that you diagnose will instill as much fear in people as cancer does. So decision paralysis is really common in these cases. So if an owner is considering palliative care, it's important to make sure that it's an educated treatment decision. I think people automatically have the knee-jerk reaction that you know cancer treatments for animals are as bad as they are in people. And most of you probably know this, that you know animals tolerate chemotherapy so much better than people do. And radiation side effects with the new types of radiation we have these days can be really minimal, depending on the site and the treatment protocol pursued. And animals bounce back from surgery a lot faster than owners think they, they will. And I often tell owners that, yeah, a lot of times we have to sedate our patients after surgery because they feel so good and want to move around, but they can't. Um, so if an owner is worried about pursuing something other than, you know, palliative care or, you know, make, make sure you know what their concerns are. If it is that they're going to get sick with chemo, you know, make sure it's an educated one. Um, and so the other important thing is I palliate all of my cancer patients, even the ones that are undergoing cancer specific treatments like surgery, like chemo radiation. So it's not palliative care or those things. Palliative care is, is a part of all of that. And so I often hear clients say things like, I don't want to pursue anything aggressive. Well, I'm going to aggressively manage your pet's pain, their discomfort, their nausea, whatever symptoms they've got. I want to stay on top of that. Um, but even after all that, you know, sometimes um, pet owners will still decide that palliative care alone is going to be the best decision. And that's something that can be chosen at any time during the treatment plan. So starting aggressive treatment um, in the beginning does not uh, mean that they cannot go to something you know, less aggressive down the line. Um, if you do have a patient who's on a sole palliative care plan, it's important to kind of schedule frequent check-ins. You know, don't just give them their, their prednisone or their NSAID and say, see ya when you're ready to say goodbye. You, know, you wanna make sure that you're staying on top of that patient's comfort. Um, and if the pet owner does decide that, you know, they're going to do, you know, that they're, they're going to pursue palliative care, I don't like calling it doing nothing. Um, pet owners often will use that phrase with me when, you know, when I'm going over the outcomes with different treatment options. And I'll say, well, what if I do nothing? And, you know, I explain, I, I don't really want you to do nothing. Like, look at all these supportive things we can do to help your pet. So, you know, and if they do decide that they are going to do nothing and I think it's especially important to hone in on this if the reason they can't pursue treatment is financial. Um, that comes with a lot of guilt sometimes. And so I'm very clear that you know palliative care is absolutely a viable treatment option. You are not doing nothing. You're not unable to pursue any kind of treatment for your pet. Um, other caregiver concerns and decision factors that will go into you know, whether or not your pet parent makes that decision is you know, they're worried about the pet's quality of life and suffering. And, and again, that goes back to making sure they're making an educated decision that you know, they're, they're not incorrectly assuming that their pet's going to handle radiation or chemo or surgery really poorly. 
um, they might have specific symptoms that they know are associated with a certain treatment plan. So, you know, if they know that chemo, even though it's not common, does have the potential to cause stomach upsets. If they have a dog who's got a really sensitive stomach, they might decide that that's not the right choice. Um, and the other ca caregiver concerns are, you know, the ability to care for the animal. Um, and, you know, you have to communicate with the owner about what is feasible for them. You know, I know that there's not that many oncologists in this state. And so I have clients that come from hours away to come see me. And so for them, you know, it might not be possible for them to pursue any kind of treatment plan where they're coming in once weekly. Um, another type of cost is, you know, obviously financial is a big one, but there's an emotional cost to having a pet with cancer. And I didn't really understand that until my own dog actually was diagnosed with cancer. And so that's something that, you know, just how much emotional toll that can take on you, especially in the early stages when you're scared and don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so that's another factor that can make owners maybe shy away from, from a particular treatment if it's something that they emotionally can't handle, a pet undergoing chemo if they had someone who, you know, they loved, had a really rough time with it. Um, if your pet owner does decide that again, you know, palliative care alone is the best treatment option, then the focus uh, um, of the clinician shifts away um, to treating the clinical signs, not necessarily treating the disease. So you want to make sure that you're managing those symptoms. Um, additionally, diagnostic testing loses its importance. It's not important to know if the cancer has metastasized if we're not going to actually be treating the cancer specifically. Um, and again, just focusing on maintaining quality of life, um, which again is, is a part of my focus even when I'm pursuing you know, aggressive treatment um, as far as chemo or surgery or radiation with a pet owner. Um, but obviously in palliative care alone, that's really your sole focus in there. So moving on to some common symptoms associated with cancer. Um, they're often dependent on the tumor type and site of the cancer. Um, so in general, you know, if you've got a bladder tumor, they're going to present with strangeria or urinary, you know, signs of pain in their abdomen. Lung tumors might make your patient cough. Mast cell tumors might cause gritis or vomiting or melena if they have secondary GI ulcers. Um, so, you know, it's really going to be tumor specific. Um, and in cases like that, many symptoms can be treated um, as you would treat those symptoms if they were due to any other cause. So a cough from a lung tumor, you know, put them on some sort of cough suppressant. If they're vomiting, you know, go for some serenia, that type of thing. So with some common uh, symptoms we'll talk about specifically, um, hyperexia, vomiting, diarrhea, coughing, decreased activity level I'll just touch on. Um, and then again, we'll kind of focus a lot on cancer related pain. So with hyperexia, um, there can be primary or direct cancer-related causes of this. If you have a gastrointestinal tumor or pancreatic or liver tumor, those might be you know, physically causing direct compression on the gastrointestinal tract, causing nausea. And then your secondary or indirect causes, maybe that pet has a lot of mast cell tumors and that's causing gastrointestinal ulceration or a gastronoma, which is secreting gastrin, also increasing gastrointestinal ulcers. Um, and really any tumor type can cause this symptom. Um, tumors you know, release a lot of cytokines. The specific ones that, can, that are known to cause hyperexia are IL-6 and IL-2. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of other chemicals and, you know, modulators that these cancers secrete that can affect appetite. Um, another thing that can cause hyperexia, though, is also imminent death. <laughs> if the body is actively shutting down, um, that might also be the reason why your pet's not eating. So trying to kind of maybe figure out, is, is this pet nearing the end of its life? Or is this something that we can manage for, you know, a few weeks or a couple months with symptoms or with um, medications is, is kind of important. Um, so managing this, you would kind of manage this as you would any other um, animal that's that's not eating well for a reason. So appetite stimulants are kind of my mainstay for these. Um, entice, um, I don't know how many of you have entice in your in your uh, uh, cabinets these days, but it's a it's a ghrelin agonist, which is the hunger hormone, and it's fairly effective in in dogs. I've used it for my chemo associated nausea as well. Um, for cats, um, mirtazapine is a good option, especially because now they come with their there's this transdermal formulation of it. So so killing any animal who's not wanting to eat, especially a cat, is really difficult. So I think the transdermal formulations are great options. And I feel like the entice is kind of nice because it's a liquid, which depending on the pet, it might be harder or easier to give them a liquid versus a pill. Um, but for, for those that's easier for a liquid, as opposed to having to get them to swallow the pill, it might be a better option. Um, 
I will often put animals that aren't eating well on antiemetics as well as as well, only because you don't know if they're not eating because they're nauseated. And as I'm sure we've all felt, you can feel nauseous and not actually vomit. So we don't really have a good test just for nausea in animals. You know, certainly you can ask the owner if the pet's drooling or lip smacking or any of those other symptoms of nausea, but um, you know, it, the only symptom could just be that they're not eating well. So you know, Serenia um, or Endansetron are usually my go-tos for uh, for treating those. And you can often do multimodal treatments. These pets can be on appetite stimulants and you can put them on Serenia and a Dancetron at the same time. So that multimodal therapy might be needed, um, you know, to help manage these patients. Um, other kind of supportive things you can have owners do is, you know, try offering a new variety of foods. A lot of times the smellier, the better. <laughs> um, and there's some supplements that you can get to. Um, I think even Fortiflora, the probiotic is flavored a bit. So I've had some cat owners have success with like sprinkling that on their food to make it a little bit more palatable. Um, and again, you kind of often need multimodal therapy. You know, you can certainly start with one medication, but if that doesn't help, you know, add in some others. Um, other kind of supportive things you can do is depending on what medications you have them on, um, you can give them or train the owners to give sub-Q injections to avoid pilling. Um, oh, Heidi, how do I make, I had a question, sorry. <laughs> how do I make, oh, just, yeah. that? okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. So a question, do you ever put dogs on Mirataz transdermal off-label for owners that have difficulty with owner meds? That is a great question and I have not. Um, usually in that setting, um, I've actually had um, compounding pharmacies compound Ondansetron into a transdermal formulation. Um, I personally don't have a lot of success with Mirataz um, that, in dogs. Um, that being said, a lot of times, you know, many of my patients I'm managing for chemo-associated nausea, so I don't know if there's something about Mirataz not being as effective for chemo-associated nausea, but that is something else that could be considered too, is putting dogs on transdermal Mirataz. Um, if, if um, they're not able to pill them. Um, and then again, my next point is just, you can chat with a compounding pharmacy and see if there's any of those medications that can be compounded into a transdermal formulation. Over. So one other question that sometimes owners will ask is placing a feeding tube in a patient that's not eating. Um, so for these guys, it's best only if used for giving medications alone in terminal pan cancer patients or if you have a pet that actually has what you think is true cancer cachexia, which we'll talk about in a minute, but that's essentially weight loss despite a normal appetite. Um, there's a lot of ethical concerns, give, you know, putting a feeding tube in an animal that is not eating because their cancer is so advanced that they feel terrible. So again, I would only use it to try to give medications, not to as a way to keep this pet alive when they're suffering. Um, and if you're going to use it just for medications, like if you're going to say, well, let's see if we can get these pet medications to make them feel better so that they're eating on their own communicate with that owner to set a date for treatment failure. Like, okay, if we're gonna do this, if your pet is not eating better at its normal level within one to two weeks, then we know it's time to say goodbye. Um, Cause you could keep a suffering pet alive a long time by placing a feeding tube. But again, that's that's not really fair and, and kind of goes against our veterinary oath in, in preventing animal suffering. Um, and I think it also takes the right owner to do that as well. If you don't think an owner would be willing to stop, then that's probably not um, an owner you should even offer a feeding tube at in that situation. Um, so again, it's just big, big ethical concerns there. Um, I never recommend these in pets that aren't eating due to painful or obstructive oral or pharyngeal tumors. Same thing. You can keep a pet with a bad oral tumor alive a long time with a feeding tube, but their face could be literally eaten away by the tumor, and that's a terrible quality of life. So I, I never place those in those patients. Um, but the other reason I don't often commend this is that there's been a few studies looking at humans that have terminal cancer. And when they are, you know, if they're not eating, they don't have much appetite or, you know, if their chemo side effects prevent them from keeping, you know, food down. So they have some sort of like, you know, feeding tube. Um, they actually report a decreased quality of life when they have increased more than self-regulated nutritional intake. So when you force feed people that also feel sick, their quality of life is worse. And so there's a lot of parallels with, you know, human and animal medicine in general. And so this is one I take to heart as well. And so again, don't really want to force feed those patients. 
Um, another thing that I've often had owners say is, you know, well, if they don't eat something, they're going to die. And it's actually the reverse. So often animal, animals with end-stage cancer or any end-stage disease, they're not going to die because they're not eating. They are Eat, they're not eating because they are dying. Their body is shutting down. They do not have those nutritional needs. So their body is not having that hunger, you know, hormone. Um, so kind of getting owners to see it that way is also, I think, helpful in, in those settings. So true cancer cachexia is weight loss um, with adequate nutritional intake. So it's not that they're losing all this weight because they're not eating. They are eating a normal amount and sometimes even more, and they are still losing weight. Um, and this is actually due to like underlying metabolic alterations that occur secondary to the cancer. And those metabolic alterations have already happened before you even notice the weight loss. Um, and it's really just due to, again, kind of excessive cytokine stimulation, which can cause insulin resistance, increased lipolysis, increased uh, pyrolysis, and upregulation of some of these factors like TNF-alpha that just increase the metabolic needs of the rest of the body. Um, it's more common in cats than in dogs, um, but, and it's also a significant concern in human cancer patients too. So in human cancer patients, in, when humans actually pass away from the cancer, it's estimated that about 20% of those deaths are actually due to cachexia. It's not necessarily the disease, it's the cachexia caused by the disease where your body just essentially wastes away. So when trying to manage this symptom, you really need, do need to treat the underlying tumor if you're going to stop this. Um, it, you know, palliative care is certainly an option, it's, but you know, it's, if, if this is a pet that you're seeing, then again, I definitely worry you know, that um, the, the end of life is probably sooner than later. Um, Unfortunately, often this is irreversible because, again, those metabolic alterations have occurred before you've even noticed the weight loss. Um, if you do have an owner that's going to pursue that, you know, I would recommend actually consulting with a board-certified nutritionist um, in regards to what is the best diet. Um, and this is one where, again, I would place a feeding tube with a really motivated owner. But it's because the pet's eating on their own, but clearly they're not eating enough or not the proper diet to actually maintain their body weight. Um, there is current ongoing veterinary research to try to identify like early serum biomarkers so that we can try to catch those metabolic alterations before they happen um, in the hopes that that can make this a more treatable condition. Uh, moving on to vomiting. So same with hyperexia. It's got pretty similar causes as far as the primary causes, if it's a direct gastrointestinal cause versus those secondary or indirect causes. Um, again, mast cell tumors or gastronomas can cause vomiting. And this is another one that any tumor type can just due to, you know, any kind of cytokine release or something that's directly stimulating your chemoreceptor trigger zone in your brain. So really any, any cancer can actually cause vomiting in the end stages. So um, these are one where you would reach for your antiemetics. Um, so Serenia or Ondansetron are usually my go-tos. Um, I've tried probiotics for some of these as well, even though obviously it's not helping your stomach, um, you know, your, any of your, your stomach in there since there's not a lot of bacteria um, living in there as part of your normal flora. But maybe they've got any of that kind of small intestinal dysbiosis that's helping. Probiotics might help those. Um, a bland diet, um, you know, obviously not ideal for the long run, but um, that's where you can reach for one of the many prescription GI foods that are out there to see if that's going to be a little bit easier on their stomach. Um, kind of like with the hyperexia, try to consider sub-Q or transdermal formulations of any of those medications if they can't keep them down enough to see if they work. Um, so yeah, um, sticking with the GI theme here, um, diarrhea, um, similar to our other gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, but another um, question that it's always important to kind of clarify with owners is sometimes I've seen animals actually present with tenesmus from obstructive masses or really big sublumbar lymph nodes that it, the owner thinks that they primarily have diarrhea, but it's just that that's all that's able to actually come out through the colon is whatever is liquid. So, you know, asking if they're straining, um, you know, is, is an important um, part of that too. And certainly a, a good rectal exam can sometimes detect if there might be something that's actually obstructive in there. Um, and secondary indirect causes, again, any tumor type can cause that just for whatever they're releasing that's affecting your, um, you know, the, the um, gastrointestinal tract. 
So like any cause for diarrhea, uh, metronidazole is usually the first thing I reach for for these two. Um, and it's just, you know, it's that antibiotic with those immune mod modulating effects on the gut. For diarrhea, the dose range I usually pick is somewhere between 10 to 15 mg per keg twice daily. Um, you can also try Tylosin if metronidazole doesn't work. I don't usually have them on both of these at the same time, but if they don't respond to metronidazole, I'll try Tylosin um, at a dose somewhere between seven to 15 mg per keg, Q12 hours. This comes in a powder, but there are some compounding pharmacies that can make it into a capsule. That's the milligram that you need in case the pet doesn't really like the powder. I don't think it's that palatable, but um, you know, if you've got like a lab that'll eat anything, that might not matter. Um, Planned diet, just like with vomiting or any of those prescription GI foods. Um, canned pumpkin is something that sometimes I'll have people try. Um, they do tend to need a lot of it. So, you know, just like a teaspoon is not going to really help for a lab, but like half a can might. Um, and again, if that's sometimes they'll have diarrhea combined with maybe not eating as much. And so, if they really like the taste of it, that might be something you can add in as well to make their food more palatable. Um, probiotics are a great option for this as well. Whether the diarrhea is caused by any type of, you know, disruption to the gut flora or that's a sequela that they've got this diarrhea and now their, you know, their gut flora is all kind of messed up. Or if you're having them on long-term antibiotics, um, probiotics might be able to help with that too. Um, so coughing is another um, symptom that can happen in end-stage cancer, um, either due to a primary lung tumor that's putting pressure on some of the major airways or pulmonary metastasis. However, pulmonary metastasis really needs to be significant for this to cause it. So if you've just got a few small lung nodules, um, you know, generally you're not going to see coughing. This um, lovely snowstorm of a chest was um, a patient that one of my colleagues saw in my residency um, who actually presented for an anal sac tumor, no respiratory signs whatsoever with lungs that looked like these. This dog was a lazy basset hound who probably did about 10 minutes of activity per day. So maybe if he'd been a more active dog, they would have noticed more respiratory signs, but just goes to show that you know animals can compensate pretty well. And, and so if you just see like one or two small nodules and that animal's coughing, it's actually probably not related. Um, other reasons for coughing are if they have invasive like upper airway tumors or like invasive thyroid or pharyngeal tumors that are affecting the trachea. Um, so those could also result in coughing too. And managing these cough suppressants, um, you know, there's those um, cough tabs you can prescribe or Hycodin as well. Um, since one of the side effects of Hycodin is sedation, I usually reserve that if, um, if a pet's having trouble sleeping or keeping the owners up at night because they're coughing so much. Um, but if it's a pet that really doesn't see that sedation side effect, it's something that they can do a few times a day throughout the day as well. Other recommendations I usually have for those owners is to kind of mi minimize any activities that are stimulating the cough. If it's an upper airway cough, um, a lot of times they're worsened with excitement. So, you know, if they're, you know, super excited or if they feel otherwise well and they want to play, you know, it's about balancing that quality of life, but maybe kind of shorten their play sessions a little bit if they're going to have a coughing fit. Um, and then another question, do you find theophylline helpful in cancer patients or can cough for cancer patients? I don't. Um, I haven't used it a whole lot, but a lot of my patients respond so well to Hycodin that I haven't reached for theophylline a lot, but that is something that could definitely be considered. All right. So I just want to touch on decreased activity level. This is a really non-specific sign. You know, they're just not themselves. They're lethargic. They don't get as excited to go on walks. Um, and this, again, can be due to any tumor type. But the reason I bring it up is just because you can try to determine if it's due to any kind of treatable cause. Um, if it's pain or lack of energy due to hyperexia, vomiting, diarrhea. So just asking some follow-up questions of like, what else is going on? You know, if they are just really lethargic and don't really feel good, there's not much you can do but if it's something treatable, you know, that's the important underlying part. Um, and then I had another question that about Temeril P for cough, um, that is an option as well. We'll kind of get um, uh, as far as kind of steroids, whether or not to use steroids or NSAIDs, um, I'll touch on that too. But Temeril P would be another consideration depending on um, the tumor type and if you've got them on any other medications like NSAIDs, since obviously that contains a steroid. Um, so decreased activity level is another one of those signs that can lead owners to, you know, euthanize their pets. You know, they're not excited anymore. They're not wanting to, you know, get, get around as, as much and enjoy all of their normal activities. So again, just trying to find out if there is a treatable underlying cause. Obviously, there's not really a supportive medication to give your dog energy. So that's not something that we can really do. But if it's due to an, a treatable underlying cause, you want to address that. 
So moving on to cancer pain. Um, this is a really important topic just because I feel like, you know, regardless of the cause, you know, you guys probably know that a lot of owners have a hard time understanding pain in their, in their patients or in their pets. Um, and so this is one of the things that it breaks my heart when I see a patient coming in that's so extremely in pain and the owner just has no idea or is in denial. So I kind of wanted to have a, a separate section on this symptom just because it's so important to manage in my cancer patients. So there's a lot of different things that contribute to cancer pain, whether it's acute mechanical stretch of the pain response receptors, um, or if the tumor is directly like infiltrating into um, any kind of, of afferent nerve, vagus, or, sorry, any afferent nerves, um, kind of that neuropathic pain as well, if they're compressing any of those nervous structures. Um, they can cause generalized pain too, if they're releasing any of those pro-inflammatory or pro-analgesic cytokines, prostaglandins, or endothelins. Um, and then what I struggle with managing is actually a lot of this wind-up pain, which is where there are permanent neurochemical changes in your dorsal root ganglion in the spinal cord, um, which then makes it even more difficult to try and treat that pain. So um, cancer pain in animals is significantly undertreated, and there's a few reasons for this. One is just that there's a lack of appreciation that many cancers are associated with pain, since animals often don't show it much. Um, and then this is something that certainly oncologists, or if you're treating the cancer in your practice, might be guilty of, is that you're focusing too much on the treatment rather than the patient comfort, which is why I stated that I make sure all my patients are palliated, that I'm not just treating their cancer. Um, it is difficult to assess pain in animals. They're stoic and, you know, they're, they're um, still somewhat wild depending on the, <laughs> depending on um, the breed. Maybe you're, it's hard to see a pack of like wild pugs running around, but, you know, they, they do still have some wild instincts that tell them to hide their pain. And plus, they're often so bonded with their owners that I feel like they don't necessarily want to show that. So, um, so yeah, it's difficult for, for us to appreciate that in them sometimes. And then sometimes it's just a lack of communication with clients that, you know, you sometimes have to use really strong words like excruciating, you know, to get clients to understand how much pain their pet is actually in. So making sure that when they walk out of that exam room, they really understand why it's important that you have them on three different pain medications. Um, with cancer pain, um, and this is adapted from human oncology as well, there's actually two different pain entities that are often seen. One is kind of the ongoing constant background pain, which humans describe as more of like a dull throbbing. It's, it's just always there. It's hard for them to sleep with that sometimes because if they're, if they're not active and doing something, it's just a constant reminder that they are often in discomfort. And there's also this intense breakthrough pain um, that's often induced by movement or weight bearing or you know, sometimes just the tumor might, you know, grow one millimeter into that, you know, nerve it's compressing and that causes that breakthrough pain. And that's very acute and severe. Um, we need to treat all of these sources of pain. Um, and so there's multiple pain pathways and receptors involved. Those are some of them listed, but in many patients with cancer pain, it is often not sufficient to have them just on a single pain medication. The tumors most likely to be painful are definitely bone tumors. We'll talk about bone cancer pain in a minute here, but any tumor that's of a primary bone tumor or one that's invading into bone, those are probably going to be the most excruciating. Um, but nervous system tumors or like spinal cord tumors are painful too. Gastrointestinal tumors can be. Um, inflammatory mammary tumors, generally not um, like a, a, you know, a low-grade mammary adenocarcinoma that looks completely normally on the skin is probably not going to be. Um, but um, you know, the ones that are super ulcerated are going to be painful. Um, genitourinary tumors like TCCs, those bladder tumors, those are painful. Um, you know, if you've ever had a UTI, it probably feels like that all the time. So that's going to be really painful. Um, oral tumors, nasal tumors are likely to be painful. Any invasive or ulcerated skin tumors are going to be um, painful too. Um, same with invasive abdominal tumors. You know, let's say a solitary liver mass, those don't really seem to be painful. Um, but if it's a liver mass that also is is invading into like three other surrounding organs and through the stomach wall, like that's probably going to be pretty painful. Um, and the key point here is just if you think there is even a chance that animal could be painful, please treat it as such. Um, you don't want to risk that animal walking out feeling in a lot more discomfort than they're letting on. Um, and the other thing I educate owners about is that in general, most cancer pain is progressive. And studies have shown in the human oncology world that when you kind of pre-treat for the pain you know is coming, you're actually going to have a much easier time keeping it to a manageable level than waiting for them to show those signs of excruciating pain. 
So bone cancer pain, again, primary bone tumors and tumors invading bone. Um, so here's like your classic distal radius, you know, bone lesion. This is probably an osteosarcus. I can't remember, but most likely just based on the appearance and the location. Obviously, we all know that's going to be painful. Um, but it's also tumors invading bone. And so another key point about you know, tumors that are likely to invade bone is that any oral tumor that's on the gingiva, I always assume those are gonna be invading bone. So this is a kitty cat squamous cell carcinoma. As you can see, it, this is located on the left lower mandible, like right up against the, the gingiva there. And so this is gonna have bone lysis. You should treat this as aggressively as you would a primary bone tumor when you're, when you're thinking about managing pain. Um, bone cancer pain causes sensitization of both the peripheral and the central nervous system. Um, and there's a whole list of reasons here that I'm not going to read out loud because it's very detailed. But the main point is there's many different ways that um, bone cancer pain occurs. It's not just eating away at the bone. There's a lot of things down to the molecular level that are happening that are causing, causing the pain to develop and then causing it to be propagated and, and even worse than, um, than it was at the very first sign of pain. So common behaviors associated with pain, not just bone cancer pain, but you know, any kind of pain, um, you know, certainly if it is on a leg, you know, limping, you know, I feel like that's something that, you know, even like with a torn CCL, sometimes owners will come in and the dog's not bearing weight and they'll be like, oh, they don't seem painful. Um, well, that's not true. So educating them that limping means pain. And then a lot of them can be more generalized signs. Like again, the decreased activity thing here, um, they might be licking or rubbing or pawing at a painful area. Sometimes they're not eating as much if it's really severe. Usually I feel like the pain has to be pretty bad for them to not eat. Um, Sometimes they're hiding or um, they're not grooming as much, more commonly seen with cats, obviously, but if there's, they're, you know, they could either be grooming too much in that area or they're just not grooming a lot if it's painful for them to get in the position to do that. Um, other things are just, they might not yawn or stretch or if it's a dog, do like the wet dog shake as much because they've just got general, you know, body pain or joint pain or stomach pain somewhere. Um, so they're not gonna do those normal behaviors. They may just be having a different posture. Um, when they're standing or sitting, um, or you know, sometimes they, maybe they're just urinating or defecating in inappropriate areas. Um, I feel like this is a common sign of like joint pain in cats, um, especially if they have a litter box that they have to hop into and that starts to hurt for them. They might just start going outside the litter box because it's painful to get in there. Um, the key point I usually make to owners is that vocalization is rare. Um, most of the time animals don't cry unless it's super severe pain. Um, and so, you know, that's often their excuse for why they don't think that their pet needs pain. It's like, well, they're not crying. And, you know, if I have a stomach ache, I don't sit there crying the whole time until it goes away. So using those kinds of examples can, can I think, help owners understand. Um, and again, kind of getting back to that treat for the expected pain. If you think there's a chance it is painful now, and if you know it's going to get painful, even if the owner doesn't think it is now, please treat for that. This is kind of a newer development in terms of interpreting pain in cats. Cats are tricky about so many different things and trying to, to read them. And so this is a, a newer development um, that was developed by this Dr. Stiegel. Um, and you can read a little bit more about it on this feeling from a scale.com. Um, and it's basically just looking at, you know, this poor kitty cat on the right there. Look, look at how ouchy he is. That picture makes him really sad. Um, but it's a scale based on five different criteria, ear position, like the orbital tightening, muzzle tension, whisker position, and head position. Um, and so they get a scale or they get assigned a number based on kind of what number they fall on the scale. And I honestly can't remember if each category is one to three or one, one to five, but basically if they're, you know, above this certain level, um, then you know they're going to be pretty painful. So I'm really happy to see that there's more research looking into cat pain. Um, that being said, the scale was looking at pain in cats post-operatively. So it's best for acute pain. Um, most cancer pain is chronic um, with those kind of sudden breakthrough episodes for acute pain. So you could use it for that, but it's maybe not something that's as helpful for owners at home, just because they're only going to, the cat's only going to be showing these signs most likely if, if they're having those breakthrough episodes. But again, I'm just, I'm encouraged that they're doing more research in pain in cats because it's so hard anyway to tell. Um, so this is another adaptation from Cancer Pain in People. So it's the World Health Organization's pain scale, um, the pain pyramid, where, you know, in humans, a lot of times they'll present with that mild pain, so the bottom of the pyramid pyramid. So a non-opioid pain medication, you know, an NSAID in people is, is reasonable. Um, and then as it escalates to moderate pain and then severe pain, you can add in additional pain meds like opioids for that. And so that's usually how they're managing cancer pain in humans. 
However, most of our patients present with the reverse pyramid approach because those early signs of pain, our patients can't talk. And so early signs of pain might show no outward symptoms. So by the time they're showing signs that the owner or that we can appreciate, often they are already at the severe pain management. And so they often need aggressive pain management to start. Um, and so that's why I often will add multiple pain meds at the beginning if the pet's already showing signs of pain. So moving on to some of these specific drugs, um, the, the first choice um, for many patients, as long as they can tolerate it, is NSAIDs. So we're all familiar with NSAIDs, but quick review of you know, your arachidonic acid pathway here. Um, NSAIDs um, can block these COX enzymes, which is that first, I think you can see my arrow. So your little COX enzymes here, COX-1 enzymes are more important for your kind of vital life functions, your physiologic functions. COX-2 are the ones that have roles in um, a lot of the pain and inflammatory mediators and so your NSAIDs are going to block both of these in general. However, there are some newer ones that kind of spare your COX-1 and, and so those are generally the ones that are, are better to reach for um, since you ideally would just want to kind of block these ones that are affecting pain and inflammation so you can preserve these other functions and therefore limit side effects. So um, again, the side effects are due to the ones that you know, primarily might or might have some effect blocking those COX-1 enzymes. So GI upset, renal and liver disease. Um, when I initially started my training, a lot of times when we would put a patient on a long-term NSAID, we would put them on omeprazole or famotidine as well. But there've actually been a few studies and at least abstracts that have been um, presented at some conferences I've been to that actually found that when you put patients on an NSAID on concurrent omeprazole or famotidine, it actually increased their risk of gastrointestinal side effects their owner noticed at home. So like vomiting or diarrhea. And the theory was that by permanently or at least long-term altering the gastric pH, some of that might have trickled down into your small intestine and start affecting your gut flora. Um, so I don't generally do this anymore. Um, you know, if they're going to have GI upset on an NSAID, I'll stop it or try a different medication rather than just add those things in. Um, because of the side effects of renal and liver disease changes, um, I do recommend monitoring lab work during treatment for these guys. Um, usually, you know, if, if, as long as everything was normal from the get-go, I'll repeat a, you know, just a, a, we call it an NSAID panel here, which checks your ALT and your BUN and creatinine, as well as a, a PCV. Um, we'll do that two to four weeks after starting, and then every two to three months or so, depending on, you know, the, the pet, and you can stretch that interval out if they've been on it for, you know, a long time, a year or so, but that's generally my initial recommendation. The other reason that two to three month interval is nice is because depending on the tumor, that might be how often I want to recheck that pet anyway, just from a quality of life standpoint. Um, Pets who develop GI toxicity with one NSAID may tolerate another. So if you put them on one and they have a really hard time with it, um, it's not unreasonable to try a different one. Um, usually I would recommend a washout period of at least three to five days. And then if they, you know, if their signs take a little bit of time after they stop the NSAID to, for the diarrhea to resolve, I would definitely want to wait a few days until even after that's resolved to try a different one. I don't recommend going through like all of them, but you know, it's not unreasonable to try two or three different ones before you say, all right, this pet just does not tolerate NSAIDs. Um, so for dogs, um, the kind of one we have the most information for as far as cancer is peroxicam. And so it does have also the analgesic effects. And the dose of that is 0.3 mg per kg once daily for dogs. But you can also try carprofen, furacoxib, daricoxib, meloxicam for kind of the pain management too. And some of those may also have the kind of the anti-cancer effects too, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you can use acetaminophen concurrently with NSAIDs in dogs. I don't like to, um, but um, just, it just makes me a little bit weary as far as like GI toxicity. Um, but, um, you know, some of the um, medications, like some of the opioid medications like codeine often come um, already with acetaminophen in it, and it is safe to give those together as long as your patient's tolerating it. Uh, for cats, meloxicam is usually the one I'll reach for. First, I do feel like peroxicam is a little bit harder on cats. Um, so you can try peroxicam, but usually just for ease of administration too. I feel like liquids are easier for some you know, cat owners anyway. Um, the range of doses is pretty broad um, for kind of long-term pain management. Um, I'll usually start, I usually start at about 0.05 mg per kg, um, maybe once daily, but the ranges are as little as 0.025 up to 0.1 every one to three days. So there's not like a wrong or a right answer here. And, and part of it might also depend on how that cat's kidneys are doing too. 
Um, you can use Peroxicam in cats again. So if, if you know you want to try it and if it's a cat you think is going to tolerate it well, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I've had a couple of cats that have just gone off food with it. So um, it's not something I usually reach for first. Um, but if for some reason they didn't tolerate Merox uh, Meloxicam, it's a reasonable alternative. Um, the dose in cats is also that 0.3 mg per, per kg, and then every one to three days, depending on um, how you're worried you are about their kidneys. Um, Robenicoxib or Onsier is an option, but it's only labeled for a maximum of three days. So I don't usually use that. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, um, so this said, I was breaking up a little, sorry, it's, let me see if I can adjust my mic. I was breaking up a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, someone wanted to confirm that I stated that concurrent use of famotidine and an NSAID may increase the chances of GI upset. Um, and yes, that is correct based on a few studies that have been done and at least presented as an abstract. I don't know if they're published yet, um, but yes, um, so far preliminary data has showed that that actually increases the risk of stomach upset, so I don't do that. Uh -huh. So, um, so yeah, I don't usually reach for onsier in cats only because of that every three day label. Um, and there have also been a few studies looking at NSAIDs in cats that have um, CKD or kidney disease. And if their disease is stable, if their BUN and creatinine have not changed in a year, it actually does seem like they might be safe at low doses. So that might be one where I reach for the lower dose or you know, the every two day or every three day dose of meloxicam. Um, and then just, I would monitor their kidney values a little more closely, maybe make sure you check it two weeks after starting and then monthly to make sure you're not making those elevate with that. Um, those are cases where, you know, if they're benefiting from the NSAID as far as their quality of life, it's a little, it's okay to take a little bit of risk with their kidneys if it's going to make them feel better when you know they might have limited time anyway. Um, and then a newer medication that's out there for dogs is galaprant um, or grapaprant. Um, so this actually inhibits PGE2, a prostaglandin. It does not bind COX. So in our lovely diagram here, this actually works below COX2. So this one should theoretically be sparing of um, all of your physiologic functions involved in this pathway. Um, so because of that, it should be safer in patients with liver or renal disease. Um, I, do, I think the label still does say to use it with caution, but if you do have a patient you know has, those, um, has some underlying liver or, or renal disease, this might be one that you could try if you really think they need a, an NSAID for the analgesic benefit. Um, the dose is two mg per kg once daily. Um, it's not approved for cats. Um, I do I think I read they might be doing some studies as far as tolerance for it. Um, they definitely would have to make some lower doses of it or lower pill sizes, um, but not an option for cats right now. Um, so opioids. Um, for um, opioids, I usually use codeine first in dogs. And before I get too in detail into opioids, I do just want to say I think a lot of um, doctors have differing opinions on how well uh, available opioids are or how what the bioavailability is of opioids in dogs as well as how well they work. Um, so, you know, this is not a, you know, you have to use these type thing, but this is what I do feel like I have benefit from um, or I, in my patients. So um, codeine is usually the one I reach for in dogs, one to two mg per keg every six to 12 hours. So another annoyingly variable dose there that I usually pick based on how severe the pain is, as well as how dysphoric that patient's gonna get as well. And this is the, the opioid that's often combined with um, acetaminophen if you prescribe it for an outside pharmacy. So again, that is safe to use in, in dogs. Um, buprenorphine is usually what I reach for in cats, and that's the really nice one because it gets absorbed sublingually. So if your pet owner cannot get the cat to swallow it, if they can get it in their mouth, they'll hopefully still at least get a good therapeutic dose there. Um, somewhere at a dose of 0.01 to 0.02 mg per keg every 8 to 12 hours. Um, you can also use fentanyl transdermal patches. These also can have variable transdermal absorption. Um, and the range of dose for those is three to five mg per keg per hours. They don't usually take effect at the serum level. They don't usually get to those therapeutic levels for I think at least like 12 to 24 hours after you place it. And they're only effective for three to five days. So these are not good long-term options, but the few cases I've used them for or are a pet who's incredibly painful, that pet owner, you know, there's family that has to come say goodbye to the dog, they have euthanasia scheduled three days from now. And so this might be something that could help keep that, 
keep that pet comfortable just for a few days. But I don't recommend using it as, you know, just to keep replacing them um, because you have to place it in a new spot every time. And so, you know, just shaving the pet to place a new one the whole time is just, you know, you should try to find another long-term option for, for those pets. Um, there are morphine tablets you can use too. I feel like even the oral versions make pets vomit, so I, I don't reach for this either. I really would only if I didn't have any of the other options available. Um, and then I don't use a lot of tramadol just because, um, you know, that's one where I feel like of all the opioids or the, op you know, the opioid derivatives, which is really what tramadol is, it's, you know, its absorption is so variable and so poor. And I have, you know, had pet owners say they've had seen anecdotal, you know, responses to it, but um, I don't use it a lot just, just because of that reason. Uh, yeah. Heidi, how do I scroll down? Oh, wait, I think I figured it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, question, is it beneficial to place the fentanyl patch over the tumor area or close to the area, such as an osteosarcoma dog? Um, great question. And it shouldn't matter because this is effective because it's getting through into the bloodstream. So it shouldn't matter where you're placing it, but good question. Um, so other pain medications, gabapentin is another one of my mainstay, and this is one that actually modulates calcium influx, um, which is part of the, it's an important molecular step in the transmission of those pain mediators. Um, so the dosage for these, I go a bit higher than what they say in, um, you know, plums um, as far as pain management. So if you're using it for some really intense pain, I usually start at at least eight to 10 make per keg every eight to 12 hours in dogs. Um, cats is another other like annoyingly variable one depending on how sedate they get anywhere from three to ten mg per keg usually I go somewhere around five for cats um, every eight to 24 hours um, the main side effect of this is it can cause some pretty severe sedation or ataxia especially in large dogs and so often for big dogs so you know with like a lot of our osteos which are generally big dogs um, I would consider starting it having the owner just give it once daily in the evening where if they're sedate who cares you're going to bed um, once daily for about seven days and then increase to twice daily. And as far as a pain management standpoint, it's not ideal, but what I have seen happen is, um, um, you know, the owner will give that drug and then they're, they're so terrified of the side effects that they stop it and they're just not going to do it again anyway. So, you know, better to have them, let them build it up and then hopefully that pet will tolerate it long term because once they've been on it for a week or two, those side effects definitely improve. Um, amantadine is another important one in my, my cancer pain arsenal. It's an NMDA antagonist and NMDA is an, is an important mediator in actually kind of the, the chronic or wind up pain cascade. So this is really good for patients that have chronic pain pain, which bone pain is definitely one of those, one of those ones. Um, and the dose is three to five mg per keg. Um, I used to only prescribe it once daily, but I've seen pets tolerate it pretty well um, twice daily. GI side effect is the most common. So if you have a pet that's having GI side effects, you can definitely um, uh, back it down. Um, in a hospital situation, you can use IV ketamine as well, which is also an NMDA antagonist, but kind of like the fentanyl patch, I would only do this if you have a pet that's like so painful and everything you've got in the hospital and you're just waiting for that pet owner to come so they can say goodbye. Um, that might, you know, give that pet a little bit of comfort until that time. But obviously, again, not a, not a great long-term solution. Uh -huh. So I actually don't have a lot of experience using these, but uh, your tricyclic antidepressants can also help modulate that pain pathway. So they inhibit those serotonergic and noradrenergic pathways um, to reduce uh, pain transmission within the spinal cord. So if you have a pet that on all those other pain meds still isn't controlled, you can add those in. I do feel like sometimes pain can actually cause um, anxiety as well. Um, you know, pain is something animals don't necessarily understand. And so, you know, if they're getting really anxious because they don't know why they can't get comfortable, maybe that's another benefit for TCAs as well. So again, I don't have a lot of personal experience in this, but this is also something that could, could add in depending on what other pain meds they're on. Um, and then muscle relaxants like methocarbamol might also be an option. Um, I think these would be most helpful for like spinal tumors or tumors that are invading into muscle that might be causing some pain related like you know muscle fasciculation so that could be added in there too um, bisphosphonates are another medication for those bone tumors or tumors invading bone. Um, so these inhibit osteoclast activity. So osteoclasts are, you know, one of those mediators that can secrete some of those, you know, cytokines that promote um, that associated bone pain. And so therefore it can help the, you know, the, the secondary pain that comes from that tumor stimulating those osteoclasts. 
Um, I usually use the drug zeledronate. There's also a drug called hemidronate, but that seems like it's a little bit more nephrotoxic, so I don't usually use a lot of that. They're both IV infusions that are given about every four weeks, um, as long as the pet looks like they're benefiting from that. Um, oral bisphosphonates like alendronate are so poorly absorbed in dogs, don't bother. If, if the owner wants to pursue a bisphosphonate, go for the injectable. Alendronate is well absorbed in cats, but there's no studies on using it for bone pain. Usually alendronate in cats, bisphosphonates also help with hypercalcemia. So if you have a cat that has like idiopathic hypercalcemia or perineoplastic hypercalcemia, that's usually where alendronate's used. So nothing yet on, on using it for bone pain in cats, but you know, it's a, it's safe and we know a dose for it, so it is um, something to consider. Um, and then just additional pain management concerns is frequent reassessment of the pain is required. So again, if you have an owner who's, you know, doing the, the palliative care alone route for, for a painful tumor, don't just give them the pain meds and send them on their way. See if, like, try to get them back for a recheck so you can make sure that that pet is comfortable. Um, another one of my kind of pet peeves is when, especially in this setting, when you're doing it palliative care, you put as needed for a pain med on the label. Please don't do this because like we talked about, pet owners aren't the best at telling if their pet's in pain. Um, and we also know that, um, you know, animals or, or that, you know, as their pain winds up, it's just going to get worse. And so it's really helpful um, to have them kind of have it already on board. Uh, let's see. Um, and question, can um, general practitioners get bisphosphonates or only through an oncologist? And nope, that is something that you can order. Um, I don't actually know where we order ours from, but it is not a, a, an oncologist specific drug. That's something you can give in practice. It's an IV infusion over about 15 to 30 minutes, diluted to 50 to 100 mils, depending on the side of the patient. So I do usually recommend still checking the kidney values before you give it, um, only because the zoledronate is not as nephrotoxic, but it may, it's at least excreted by the kidney, so it's good to check that. Um, and then another question, any experience with lidocaine patches? Um, I don't. Um, I know those are used a lot for post-operative pain, so I wouldn't hesitate to try those um, for, for cancer pain as well. I don't, I'm not actually as familiar with those, and so um, as far as the duration, if it's similar to a fentanyl patch, then I probably would use it in the, like a similar setting as the, fet as the fentanyl patch, where it's kind of a short-term thing there. All right. Um, so again, kind of please avoid putting as needed on the labels. If this is for a terminal pet, you know, is painful, just put as directed. <laughs> um, don't have them just give it here and there. And the other thing is for a lot of these drugs, they're much more effective if they um, are maintaining their serum levels constantly rather than fluctuating. So you're going to have a much better chance of controlling that pet's pain if they're getting that constant dosage. Um, and then obviously be aware of drug interactions. A lot of your patients are going to have um, that kind of severe pain that they present for the top of the, that pain pyramid. Um, so I usually do put these patients on multiple pain meds when I first see them. Um, but you just need to check all those drug interactions if you're going to add in multiple things. And so making friends with your friendly neighborhood pharmacist or just checking in palms is really important to do. Um, you can also consider alternative therapies for these as well. So, you know, there's some nutraceuticals that might be out there. Um, you know, there's not a lot of studies on dosing or data or bioavailability, so I would not use one of those things alone, but may help. And then acupuncture is another consideration that you can consider adding in conjunction with oral pain meds that might help benefit that patient. Um, household modification may also be necessary too. So if you have a pet that's really painful in a leg, you know, the owner might need to, you know, add more padding to the house, make sure their beds are really cushioned. And, you know, we all know those dogs that you buy like the big expensive orthopedic bed and they just want to lay on the hard floor. So obviously you can only do so much, but, you know, just making sure that they have everything at home that they need just supportively to keep that pet comfortable. Um, so, um, one of the topics I get questions on a lot from referring veterinarians is, should I put this dog on prednisone or paroxicam if they're not going to do anything? So I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. So prednisone or prednisolone, in general, um, I usually, oops, sorry, another question. Um, have you been suggesting CBD for cancer pain? So great question. And because of the kind of um, iffy legality of that right now at the federal level, I cannot. Um, my kind of blanket statement with owners is that, you know, you know, the other d downside to CBD is because it's not federally regulated. Um, we know that like the pain modulating abilities of that are actually quite variable based on the plant um, and from the crop. And so 
you know, without it being FDA regulated, you don't know if what one product's CBD, you know, what the concentration of their, you know, eicosanoids is, if that is that the same as another product. And so without having any regulation, we don't know exactly what the pain relieving dose of it is. And that combined with just the legality, we can't really recommend it yet. Um, I am hopeful, like they use it in human cancer pain and they also use it in humans for chemo associated nausea. Um, so I definitely have interest in it, but from those standpoints, we can't really recommend it yet. Um, so um, again, prednisolone, those steroids, they're generally preferred for hematopoietic and many round cell tumors. So if you have one of those tumor types, you usually reach for steroids in the palliative care setting. So this would include your lymphomas, your leukemias, multiple myeloma, any solitary plasma cell tumor that's non-surgical or mast cell tumors. Um, Key point here is only start prednisone after the diagnosis or if the client is not gonna pursue definitive treatment um, with chemotherapy. With, your, with a lot of your hematopoietic tumors, not mast cell tumors, but with lymphomas and leukemias, prednisone is gonna prevent you from ever getting a definitive diagnosis and it can also make that pet resistant to um, definitive treatment. So it can make them resistant to chemo. So it's a very reasonable option for pet owners who are not gonna pursue you know, more definitive treatment, but just make sure that they know it's gonna make it very difficult if they change their mind. Um, so yeah, hold off if the client's going to consider chemotherapy. Um, and the reason why it's preferred for these tumor types is that it is directly toxic to your lymphocytes and plasma cells. It inhibits glucose transport um, and phosphorylation within lymphocytes, and plasma cells are really just differentiated B lymphocytes. Um, so it is actually toxic to those, which is why it can make the diagnosis difficult if it lyses enough of those cells that they can't see the morphology to call the diagnosis. And so for the cancer dose, it's usually about a mig per keg once daily for dogs. I do once daily just for ease of administration and the the mig per keg is um, you don't need to go up to an immunosuppressive dose but that's usually a dose sufficient for cancer but you can taper that based on side effects that's usually my starting dose but if that pet is like peeing in the house like go down a dose that's you know we'll call about quality of life and both the, the pet owner quality of life is important too so they're not having accidents um, Typically, I would dose at five mg total per cat or every 12 to 24 hours, uh, or every 12 to 24 hours, depending on the size of the cat and the severity of, of the sign. So, you know, your nice big, like 15 pound cat, go at five twice daily, that type of thing. Or if they're, you know, a, a GI lymphoma and they're really not eating much at all, that would be another kind of time. Or even if it's a small cat, do, do the twice daily. Cats typically need higher doses of steroids than dogs do to get kind of the same, same effects. Uh, so it does have really potent anti-inflammatory effects. And so if you think that inflammation is a significant component of the pain, NSAID, or um, prednisone may also be more effective than an NSAID. So like spinal cord and brain tumors, those are notorious for causing a lot of peritumoral inflammation. And that's what can cause the spinal pain or you know the, the brain on fire sensation. I'm not sure those pets are feeling. So I would use prednisone for those tumor types as well. Um, and then if you have a pet that's painful and not eating well, prednisone might help because of that wonderful polyphagia side effect that they can cause. So that would be another reason to reach for, for PRED over, over NSAIDs. Um, and then hypercalcemic patients. So if you have a pet that's got blood work that looked like this friend's did, where the total calcium is 15 and the ionized is 1.8, um, reach for it in those dogs. I do divide it BID in hypercalcemic patients just because I feel like that gives a better kind of more even calciuresis throughout the day. So I would do half a mg per keg twice daily in those patients. So paroxicam, um, I would use paroxicam or an NSAID for carcinomas, either a confirmed or suspected. And that's because a lot of carcinomas will overexpress COX-2, and that's been identified in multiple carcinoma types. Um, there are other non-carcinoma cancers that do this, but carcinomas are very, very well known for doing this. And unlike steroids, paroxicam or NSAIDs are okay to start before definitive diagnosis. It's not like cytotoxic to them. So if you think your dog has a bladder tumor, it's okay to start the paroxicam before you get your definitive diagnosis. That's not going to change things. Um, this is a list of, tumor, of carcinomas that have been known to do this, but again, it can happen with any carcinoma and with any tumor type. So if, even if you don't have a definitive diagnosis, you know, you can start that lung mass on, on an NSAID if, you, if the owner doesn't want to do further workup and definitely those bladder tumors as well. 
Um, it is a more potent analgesic than prednisone. So again, if you think the pet is super painful and it's not necessarily an inflammatory type of pain, I would usually reach for an NSAID. And there is the most anti-tumor in vitro data with paroxicam at that kind of, again, 0.3 mg per kg once daily. However, other NSAIDs may be effective and we're getting more studies about these other NSAIDs as well. And so if paroxicam is, you know, since you do have to compound it, if that's really difficult for you to prescribe or for your client to obtain, it's okay to use another NSAID if that's way easier. Um, so when you're having your pet on all of these medications, it's obviously important to prioritize medications based on the severity or the potential for severity of signs if untreated. So I prioritize pain meds hands down. Those are the most important ones to me. Um, and then you want to avoid medications that are causing significant adverse effects. So again, if you have a, if you have a pet that you know, no matter what NSAID you try, gets blowout diarrhea. Like, okay, that pet doesn't get an NSAID, try something else. Um, and then it's also sometimes helpful if you can provide other supportive care to reduce the need for multiple medications. So, you know, maybe that patient won't eat their normal dog food anymore. Well, rather than add in a bunch of appetite stimulants or anti-nausea medications, just maybe see if they'll try another food or sprinkling some, some you know, boiled chicken on their food. Maybe they'll eat that and then you can kind of limit how many meds that pet owner is having to give. Um, as far as other kind of non-pharmacologic therapies, I already mentioned acupuncture is a consideration. And then some lifestyle changes you can educate owners about maybe making to improve that pet's quality of life. So all pets with oral tumors, I recommend they feed a soft food diet, either softening their kibble for about 10 minutes beforehand, um, or um, you know they can switch to a canned diet, that type of thing. Um, and the question, can you comment on prednisone with hemangiosarcoma? Um, so I don't generally use prednisone for hemangiosarcoma. There's um, no evidence to my knowledge about its effects. Um, I wouldn't use it, you know, and um, I'm not sure if you're asking about it as like a maybe tumor slowing effect um, or from a comfort, you know, if, um, if that pet is potentially, you know, end stage not eating, sure, you know, what, you know, might as well have every pet, you know, have, have a little bit of pred before they go. Um, but there's not a lot of, of um, thorough good evidence that it might have any benefit at kind of slowing things for those. So I might just use it if you thought it may, might make the pet feel better. Um, other lifestyle changes would be um, carpeting hardwood floors if you have a pet that's got some joint pain. Um, and that kind of goes for any joint pain, not necessarily cancer. Um, again, kind of multiple comfortable beds throughout the house, um, limiting access to stairs, high surfaces, pools, unsupervised. Um, harnesses to assist when rising, um, adjusting temperature for patient comfort. Sometimes um, having something cool on the joint might actually help with pain or something warm on the joint might help with pain. Um, so kind of adjusting temperature if you think your pet's really uncomfortable. Um, and then for pet owners that you're really worried about, you can sometimes refer them to an in-home care service, um, you know, or an in-home clinic, or if any of you guys have practices that do at-home evaluation, sometimes going there and seeing what their setup is like for their pet, if their pet's having a hard time getting around can be really helpful. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on the importance of the recheck exam. So it's important to do a frequent reassessment of quality of life. Um, you know, you need to do um, frequent, the frequency of how often you check them is dependent on the tumor and expected progression. Um, typically that's one to three months, depending on how quickly you think this cancer is going to progress. And you can also factor in how observant the client is and how stressed the pet is in the hospital. So if you have a really nervous, nervous pet, you know, try, maybe you can utilize telemedicine that I know some people are doing these days. Um, or if you, have a, if you have a client that you know is going to be really vigilant about watching that pet owner or watching that pet for changes, maybe you don't need to do it as often. Um, let's see. And then question, dose of acetaminophen safe in dogs with codeine? It's the same dose as the labeled one, which I want to say is like five to 10 mix per cake, but it's honestly whichever one is in plums, that's the one that's safe for codeine. You don't have to worry about drug interactions with those. So yeah, just check whatever plum says. Sorry, I don't remember that off the top of my head. Um, so the other importance of the recheck exam is to determine if doses of medications are appropriate um, of, for balancing versus benefits versus side effects. So I think about this most with prednisone, like maybe that pet is eating much better on prednisone, but they're peeing in the house all of the time. Um, so definitely you can adjust the pain, the, the dose at that time. 
Um, the other benefit of the recheck exam is to help evaluate if the owner should start considering euthanasia. Um, you know, I call it a quality of life check and, you know, our pets are so bonded to our people and vice versa. You know, a lot of times the owners are not going to want to think about if things have really drastically changed. And so, um, you know, in my opinion, euthanasia is also a medical treatment. And so as clinicians, it's our job to bring up medical treatments that we think would benefit that pet. So if you think that that pet is nearing the end, it's okay to use those rechecks as, you know, an opening point for a discussion of, you know, you think that that pet's quality of life is suffering and all these medications aren't helping and maybe we need to start thinking about end of life. Um, you can also use it for monitoring lab work for NSAIDs, again, kind of weighing the benefits of, you know, if you do have a cat with CKD and they feel great on this NSAID, maybe you're not going to stop that even if their CKD is progressing, knowing that they have limited time left. But, you know, if you have a pet that hopefully is going to do well for a while, then and if you do have a substitute for an NSAID, if they're not tolerating it, it's still good to do that monitoring. Um, and then the recheck exam is required for controlled medications. So, you know, for if I have a patient on an opioid, I do um, recommend that or I do need to see them, you know, frequently to make sure that I can legally continue to prescribe those medications. So that's the other foot you can stand on if you've got an owner that is not wanting to bring them in. You're like, well, it's legally required to. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit about death and euthanasia, since obviously the very likely sequela to these um, pets with terminal cancer um, is going to be this, and I am definitely not an expert on this. And I'll be honest, I feel like a lot of my um, patients actually go back to their primary care veterinarian for this. So I, you guys probably do more euthanasias than I do, but certainly I have those discussions with owners very often as part of kind of the what to expect um, kind of as this cancer progresses type thing. Um, so, you know, quality of life is something that is obviously very subjective, and so I think it's helpful to try to give owners some more objective parameters to use when they're monitoring that. Um, so, you know, educating clients to give them the tools they need to make that decision is a really important part when, of, of that palliative care discussion as well. And so if a client's open to it, have conversations early. So again, I, I often have these conversations with clients at their new consult because especially if they know they're going to pursue palliative care alone, they want to know what to expect. And so, you just need a drink. So having those conversations before the pet is sick, I think can give them, um, you know, they're, they're going to be able to process things better than when they're emotional and afraid they're going to lose that pet that day. So I think it's nice to try to bring this up before the pet starts feeling sick. One of my things that I talk to owners about is the five favorite things rule. So again, we're trying to make a very emotional, subjective decision a little bit more objective. So I tell owners to list five of their pet's favorite things. And yes, one's usually eating, but there's a lot else that's important for quality of life besides eating, you know, playing and going for walks or even just snuggling with you on the couch. And so I usually recommend euthanasia when the pet is no longer doing three or more of those things. I don't recommend waiting till they can't do anything um, just because dogs are so stoic. And so if you wait till they can't do anything they love, it's, you've probably waited a little bit too long. Um, there are several quality of life scales out there. Um, some you know, clinicians have created their own. I adapted this one that's by a wonderful oncologist named Alice Vill Villalobos, um, but Lap of Love have, has one as well. And again, I, you know, some of you may have even come up with your own. And so just find what works for you and what you think is gonna benefit your clients most. But um, this is the one I use that's been adapted. So the, her original scale is on a scale of one to 10. You can see the range on the left there where you assign it a number. I just felt like that was too much. Much. you know I want to know just like the yes no sometimes so one is they're never doing this thing or they're you know they're they're always uncomfortable and then three is they feel great and then um, they kind of assign a number to each one of these categories total them up and then I said the cutoff of 16 points or higher is an acceptable quality of life um, but I added the caveat that that's not a hard and fast rule that once they hit this it's time that type of thing and if anything sometimes this tool is just helpful to track things you know again especially as you know this pet is eventually going to pass away or be euthanized from this disease maybe they do this you know every you know once a week or something or maybe even when it gets bad once a day and then they can monitor those trends and see that okay they've been a point lower every single day for the last week maybe now it's time um, other things that you can do at that kind of initial palliative care discussion is like encouraging clients to make a bucket list. Like how cute is that to like get your dog to go get a puppuccino or your cat gets to try like real fresh tuna for the first time. Like all those things are important to, to make sure that they're, they're still enjoying life. Um, and the other thing that I tell owners too is 
euthanasia for any terminal disease, whether it's cancer or another known terminal disease, it is not just relieving current suffering, it is preventing further suffering. And so I've euthanized patients that are still eating, that are still active, they're just not 100% and their owners cannot bear to see them get any worse. And that's okay, like that's the right decision for them. So I tell people it's okay to say goodbye on a good day. Like it's actually really wonderful and beautiful in my opinion to be able to like give a dog a cha a cheeseburger and it's if it's still eating they get a burger on their last day like that's that's so fun for them and one of my good friends like her dog passed away she euthanized him with his nose full of a wendy's frosty like what a way to go so like it's nice sometimes to be able to you know let them go when they're still feeling good um I don't know if you guys have seen this blog. I don't recommend reading it without Kleenex nearby, but um, she's a photographer who does a lot of pet photography, Robin Arauti. And she has this blog that's um, told from the point of view from an adorable black lab who also had bone cancer that had grown back as like a stump recurrence. He did have an amputation, but it's just called I Die Today. And I'm not gonna talk about it too much because it'll make me cry thinking about it. But it's, again, the dog is obviously not completely miserable. Um, and he had a beautiful day as his last day. So that's something else I've referred clients to if they're really struggling with that decision. Um, and along with that, this was one of our um, oncology patients that we did euthanize through us. So this is Promise, and I'm probably going to tear up looking at her because we adored her. And this was her last day. She was still eating. But look at how happy that pity face is to see all of us. She actually, um, she's not in quite a palliative care case until the very end. She underwent about a year and a half worth of chemotherapy for lymphoma and then stopped responding. And her owner didn't want to pursue anything beyond that, which obviously is not giving up because she kept her alive and with great quality for a while but Promise loved all of us because we spoiled her and gave her lots of treats when she was here. So she spent her last day hanging out with us and, you know, still felt well enough to play with toys. And so it was just a really beautiful day. And so it's really nice to be able to, to do that. And so again, that's why I'm, you know, not to push anyone towards euthanasia before they're ready, but it is completely okay to do it when the pet is still wanting to play and wanting to eat, because that's a really beautiful way to send them out. So anyway, um, so other kind of just ethical dilemmas that need to be, you know, mentioned is, you know, some caregivers goals are to have the pet die at home. And so, you know, we all probably have kind of our own opinions on this. Um, and the, the thing is about passing away from a disease, the dying itself is not painful, disease is painful. And so, you know, making sure their quality of death is just as good as their quality of life is really important. So, you know, however you think that pet is going to pass away, make sure that you've got, you know, pain meds on board and sure that pet is comfortable. Um, for cases like this, I do usually recommend that clients get in touch with one of the many in-home hospice and euthanasia services we have in the Twin Cities. Some of you might be those, and so you guys are a great resource for those of us who don't go to the home. Um, but again, just that education to make sure clients know what to expect in those settings is really important. Um, and then just emotional support. So self-care is really important for both clients and also the veterinary team. Like we all know what, um, oh, I'm just getting real chatty, sorry. <laughs> we all know, um, you know, what, you know, uh, how, how much mental health has fortunately come to the forefront of our profession. And, you know, we'd be lying to ourselves if we said that, you know, helping pet owners say goodbye like that, you know, it takes a toll on us, some more than others, but it's important that you have self-care for yourself, your staff, as well as your client. Um, so knowing your resources for help, we're very lucky here at AERC that we have a fantastic social worker who is here for staff as well as clients. Um, and so if you don't have that at your practice, just know where you can send those, you know, those pet owners or those staff who might need to, to talk to someone about, about what they're struggling with and, and what just happened. Um, and then allowing yourself time to feel in grief too. Again, we're not robots. And so it's okay to cry about your patients. Like that's okay. Um, and you know, sometimes it's hard because you might have to say goodbye and then you flip the switch and go meet the happy new puppy. Um, but allow yourself that time to, to feel too. Um, you know, we're all human. Um, and then we'll kind of finish the talk off just with some case examples of some palliative patients that I had managed. Um, some of them did undergo cancer treatment initially and then um, kind of uh, transitioned to palliative care. Um, so that just kind of highlights that they can change their mind at any time. They don't have to keep doing everything. So Bob was a dog um, with apogrin gland anal sac adenocarcinoma. So he was a 12 year old male castrated Shih Tzu who actually presented to our ER for really severe tenesmus. So 
he really could barely get any, any stool out. Um, on his rectal exam, he had a two centimeter right anal sac mass and severe sublumbar lymphadenopathy on exam. Um, he also was hypercalcemic, um, so uh, confirmed on both total as well as ionized. And this was his CT scan that he had. So I don't know how often you guys look at CT scans, but this is a cross section through his kind of lumbar region. So here's his vertebrae. Here's his bladder down here. Here is his colon, so this is his sternal region. Um, and then this little snowman-shaped creature, those were all of his enlarged lymph nodes. So his colon should normally sit right up here, um, but obviously being pushed a little bit, which definitely explained his tenesmus. So unfortunately in situations like this, chemotherapy and radiation are not gonna shrink these either significantly and definitely not quickly enough. Radiation more than chemo has a chance, but it's not immediate. So um, his owner was not ready to euthanize then, which was the alternative because he was so uncomfortable. Um, and so he did, um, so we underwent that CT scan and he actually did move forward with um, surgery. He had a partial lymphadenectomy. So our surgeon went in and removed as many of those big lymph nodes as they could, as well as removed that um, anal sac tumor. But just due to the sheer number and size of those big lymph nodes, there was residual disease left behind. And so they followed up with me to discuss their options. Um, what's interesting is they were able to remove enough of the tumor tissue that his calcium actually was normal after surgery and he was feeling great. Um, so we chatted about doing, you know, following up with chemotherapy or radiation, but at that time the owner did kind of pursue, um, you know, not to do any further treatment. We talked about putting him on an NSAID. Um, his calcium was normal, otherwise I would have done prednisone, but it's a carcinoma, so putting him on an NSAID, but the owner really just, this dog didn't take pills very well. They could get him in there, but he didn't want to do it if he didn't have to, and he was actually really comfortable afterwards. Um, so um, he was, um, again, doing well after surgery, so no additional meds. Um, he did have recurrent tenesmus and hypercalcemia about two months after surgery, which is around when I wanted to see him back for a recheck anyway. Um, and so at that time, we did start medical therapy. So we put this dog on prednisone, half a mig per kg twice daily, um, as well as lactulose to help soften his stool so he could get through those big lymph nodes that had grown back and were compressing his colon. Um, I can't remember what his final lactulose dose was, but this is another medication. You kind of have to taper it based on if they're having horrible diarrhea or not. Um, and then gabapentin for his discomfort. Um, he did clinically well for about two more months. Um, those meds made him really comfortable um, and then they stopped making him more comfortable and the owner just elected euthanasia rather than trying to add in more medication. So he had you know, about four months of good quality life in that setting. This very handsome fellow, um, his name's Merrick. Um, he presented um, for a progressive lameness and swelling of the carpus, and I'm sure you all know where this is going. Um, so this was his right carpal swelling with his matching radiograph. And I like this radiograph too, because it's not such a horrible, you know, it's, 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 a, it's not a super subtle lesion, but it's not like the starburst one like I showed you earlier. So they're not always that, that big and, and large and in charge, but he was quite painful. Um, so he was started on um, carprofen and gabapentin by his primary veterinarian where he actually initially was seen. Um, so they started him on two meds from the get-go, um, which was good, and then came in and spoke with me. They were not interested in amputation or chemo, mostly due to cost concerns. Um, so they did elect for palliative care alone. Um, we did not do any further testing. So we never actually confirmed that this was osteosarcoma versus another less likely bone tumor. Um, we didn't do any chest x-rays. Um, it wasn't gonna change anything. So we didn't do any of that testing. Um, his plan was to continue his carprofen and gabapentin. I added in amantadine, and then um, we started him on zeledronate as well. Um, so he improved a lot with the addition of those medications, um, and then felt great for six weeks before he was actually euthanized due to new onset seizures, which I'm suspecting were unrelated. It's very uncommon for bone tumors to metastasize to the brain, um, but he was a golden, so he may have had like a secondary primary brain tumor, I'm not sure, but not a side effect of his medications, I don't think. Um, this little scruffy girl is Daphne. Um, so she was a dog diagnosed with multicentric lymphoma. Um, the owners declined staging tests like x-rays and an ultrasound, which honestly, even if she had wanted to pursue chemo, um, those are not required to pursue chemo. We just need the diagnosis and lab work to do that. But since we were not going to do anything aggressive um, treatment-wise, she didn't want to, to do that. Um, we did treat her with l which is kind of a mild chemotherapy drug that you don't need monitoring blood work for. And we also started her on pre in his own. Um, she responded great to the first dose. Her lymph node shrank a lot. And then after her second l aspartaminase dose, they grew. So she was resistant. So they pursued kind of palliative care alone with prednisone. 
she was really PUPD on her amig per keg per day dose. So we decreased her to half amig per keg once daily. And she was still doing well. Um, five months later, mom just actually emailed me earlier this week um, and she's feeling great. Her lymph nodes are huge, but she feels well. But we plan to add serenia and entice um, if her appetite does start being affected by this. Um, I also really love this owner because um, when they knew they weren't going to pursue like full bore chemotherapy and we're going to have limited time with her, they said, well, commence Operation Fat Daphne. So she gets to eat whatever she wants and she's gained about two kilograms since she's been a patient of mine, which she only came in at about 12. So that's pretty good. So they're, they're doing good there. Um, and then this guy, Barkley, he is a mast cell tumor with on his nose here. Um, so that was confirmed with an aspirate at his primary vet. Um, so he had that awful little nasal mast cell tumor. Owners elected palliative care due to financial constraints. You know, certainly he would have needed a pretty big surgery to try to get rid of that, and they couldn't pursue radiation or chemo financially. So his palliative care plan consisted of diphenhydramine and famotidine, which are two medications all mast cell tumor dogs that have visible disease should be on, and then prednisone to kind of see if we could help shrink that. That. Um, prednisone was eventually decreased as well in his case to half a mig per keg every other day to minimize his side effects. Um, and the mass intermittently bled, so we also added in you know, and bio to see if that would help. Um, and it did slow it a little bit. And he actually lived eight months before he was euthanized due to just uncontrolled bleeding from the tumor. So, you know, eight months of good quality time for that happy guy. Um, and then the last one, I didn't want to leave out kitties. So if you can see by her pretty severe facial asymmetry here, Penelope had a right-sided oral tumor. So um, she had a right maxillary tumor that had inconclusive cytology results. They thought it might have been a sarcoma, um, which would be a less common oral tumor. Most oral tumors of cats are, are carcinomas. Um, but this is another one that we kind of, regardless of what it is, oral tumors in cats generally don't have a great prognosis. And so the owner elected palliative care. And she also had some financial constraints as well. Um, so her palliative care plan, again, oral tumors are painful, very painful. So she was started on both buprenorphine and meloxicam. Um, her um, baseline renal values were normal, um, and she also hadn't been eating much. So we did add in mirtazapine in case any of this was nausea, not just pain. Um, and we also gave her an injection of convenia because the tumor smelled horrible, and I'm fairly certain had a secondary infection when we got her. Um, and she actually improved greatly on medication. She was eating like a champ. Um, we did recommend recheck exams um, with blood work due to her being on the meloxicam, but this cat got so nervous in the hospital, fortunately not fractious, but she would like puke in the car on the way. And so since we were focused on quality of life, um, we elected not to do any in-person rechecks and the owner was well aware of the risks of NSAIDs and kidney disease. Um, we kind of just did telemedicine consults and she emailed me photos to maintain that valid client doctor patient relationship. And she actually lived six months before her lethargy and inappetence, um, you know, ultimately led to her euthanasia. So in conclusion, I went a little bit over, sorry, um, but um, palliative care is an important part of all cancer treatment. So again, I don't just do everything or just palliative care. It's, they're, they're intertwined, but sometimes it's a reasonable option as a sole therapy as well. Um, and there's almost always something that can be done to help cancer patients. Um, it's very rare that there's nothing we can do. Um, and in general, just treat the treatable, whatever symptoms the cancer is causing. If you've got a medication or a therapy or something that can be done to help that, like try and treat that. Um, those are my references, um, and I think I just got another question, and I'm happy to take any of those. Throw them in there. Um, so, yeah, so um, question is, um, I talked about acupun acupuncture for pain management, thoughts on laser therapy for comfort. Um, so I have mixed feelings on that, um, only because laser therapy is thought to stimulate cell growth. Um, and so cell growth is obviously something that could promote cancer progression. No studies on this. Um, so again, it's one of those things where you might hasten the patient's inevitable demise if you progress the cancer, but if you make them more comfortable, maybe that's a balance you are willing to strike. So that's my only hesitation with laser therapy. Any other questions? Let's see, how effective do you find prednisone for shrinking mast cell tumors? Is it reasonable to do before surgery? Um, yes, it can. The only downside to prednisone is sometimes it is so effective, it makes the gross disease go away completely. 
So um, making surgery really difficult if you can't actually see where it is. So if you, and the other thing is your margins are gonna be, you know, if you know you're not gonna get good margins, which I'm assuming that if you're trying to shrink it first, you're probably not, um, you're still gonna have to follow up with some sort of, of follow-up therapy. So if it's, an, if it's a tumor that's so big, you can't even do like a macroscopic surgery to remove the bulky disease, then yes, go ahead and try PRED, but take lots of pictures so you know where the tumor was in case it responds completely. Um, and then another question, um, any thoughts on medications for managing bleeding tumors? Unin Biao, aminocaproic acid. Um, I do use a fair amount of Unin Biao for some of those kind of bleeding, you know, bleeding tumors. Um, there's variable doses out there. Um, and I just kind of go based on like the patient's body size, whether it's, you know, twice daily or three times daily or how many capsules it is. I haven't used a lot of aminocaproic acid in those, but that's something else that could be considered as well. Um, <laughs> Um, and I would love to see a seminar that discusses basic chemo treatment you can do in a general practice. Um, yeah, that's something we can definitely consider. The main concern is just that with the new regulations about chemotherapy handling, the equipment needed for general practitioners to have chemotherapy is a lot. So you'll have to have a sterile hood, a separate chemo administration room, a separate chemo storage room. Um, they're kind of tightening down on those regulations. So you have to have a high enough caseload in general practice to make it financially feasible for, for you. Um, and then questions, did you say dorsal root ganglion changes can be permanent for the wind-up pain? Yes, yes they can. So that's why it's better to treat early to see, you know, if, if you do catch that patient's pain early, um, try and treat aggressively from the get-go and then hopefully you can minimize that. Um, Oh yes, and then a note about MN Pets is another great home at home euthanasia end of life care service. So thank you. Yes, there's um, MN Pets, um, Lap of Love. There's one called Blue Skies Pet Hospice. So we have we're very lucky in the Twin Cities. We have several wonderful at home um, places. So yeah, MN Pets is another one to to reach out to. Um, and then any thoughts on homeopathic arnica for bleeding? Um, I don't have a lot of experience with a lot of the homeopathic medicine. I really just always like to see the studies kind of showing that. So I think a lot of those are um, more anecdotal based. So that's something else that could be considered if you've seen it work for other bleeding tumors. Um, and as long as there's no known interactions with other supplements and things like that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys for sticking around. Appreciate it. Turn you back over to Heidi for a minute here. Thank you. Great job, Dr. Keller, thank you. Some really important information. Um, I don't know if I've shared this with too many people, but uh, end of life care and this kind of thing is kind of my, my second passion, and that's why um, about a decade ago, I started the Pet Loss Support Group here at AERC. And just to um, give a mention on that, to my knowledge, we're the only Pet Loss Support Group that's practicing during the pandemic. Now, if I'm wrong about that, certainly please email me. I know the Humane Society in Golden Valley is not holding theirs. So um, those people who are watching right now from the west side of town, your clients might not have an option available. We are not meeting in person, but we are still continuing to hold our pet loss support group via Zoom. And that's actually been very successful. I think it's helpful for people to have that option. And honestly, they may not feel like leaving the house um, when they're in this severe grieving as it is anyway. So I think it's actually made it more accessible. And even after the restrictions are lifted, we'll probably continue to offer it via Zoom in some form or another just to make it easier for people who don't want to travel anyway. Um, I would also second um, recommending scales to your clients. I've used those personally um, in the past with at least three of my pets and I found them very validating. Um, please remember, I've heard this feedback from people in pet loss support group over and over again, that a lot of people in their lives are telling them, you'll just know when it's time. And it's kind of magical thinking and it's really not very helpful. So um, it's great if the, the scientists in their lives, their veterinarians can give them um, a more objective way, like Dr. Keller said, to translate this really emotional experience into something that they can look at and go, oh yeah, any time now would be, um, would be appropriate and I don't have to worry that, it, that I'm doing this too early. Um, and lastly, um, MinPets is great. They have a licensed human animal bond social worker named Christy Lehman. We have one on staff here too at the An um, Animal Emergency and Referral Center of Minnesota. And her name is Colleen Crockford. If you have a client um, who is really, really struggling 
Colleen is here um, to help our team as much as she is to help clients too. And um, they don't have to be an immediate client of AERC. So you can call, have them call our main number, ask for Colleen, um, she, they can leave her a message and she is happy to help them, chat with them over the phone. It's not therapy on an individual basis, but she's happy to chat with them. Um, and I know a lot of you don't have time to do that, especially right now. So she can help them. And if she feels um, their, their need is very severe, she can help refer them to other resources as well. Um, Someone wants to know how would they refer to our pet loss support group. All you have to do is um, have people call us and let us know they're coming. They can email me personally, myself and Colleen, the social worker, facilitate that group. And um, if they email me at habrenigan at aercmn.com, I send them the Zoom link. The group currently happens once a month. It's typically on the fourth Tuesday of the month. However, for the holidays, so for November and December, it's on the third Tuesday of the month to avoid the holidays. So we will continue to meet. We're just not gonna meet on Thanksgiving and, and Christmas Eve. 